Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this meeting of the Economic Policy Working Group. And we're very happy to have Charlie Closter speak to us with his decade of experience in the FOMC and his kibitzing afterwards. And it's a very important time, as we know. The title is terrific, I think, The Fed's Risky Experiment, but the subtitle is even better. Why the new framework is so troubling and might there be a better way? So, uh, Charlie, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, as I mentioned, Charlie was uh, president and CEO of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank and distinguished professor as a visiting fellow at Hoover. So welcome, Charlie. And uh, we'll, we'll interrupt if you don't mind from time to time, but save most of the questions until you're done. So thanks so much. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. And certainly, I don't mind interruptions. I'm used to that. Um, so I'm happy to, happy to be here. You know, it wasn't, um, but uh, a little over a year ago, I think it was September 30th or October 1st, when uh, Mickey Levy and I uh, gave a paper here in the, in the seminar entitled The Murky Future of Monetary Policy. Uh, some of you may remember that, others may not. But um, what I have to say today is going to be um, uh, building off of that maybe some repetition of some of the points there and some elaboration as well. Um, the message, one of the messages we gave back then was um, that we felt like the new framework uh, that the Fed had proposed the previous month was likely to result in monetary policy becoming more discretionary, um, more unpredictable, and likely less successful, at least relative to what the Fed seemed to want. So what I'm going to talk today about a little bit is about um, I'm going to review the statement of long run policy, long run objectives and, and, and monetary policy that was created in 2012 um, when I was at the Fed and I was deeply involved in that at the time. Um, and uh, I'm going to review a little bit about that and then uh, jump to the new version that they released last year. Um, and focus on some of the changes that were made. And as John said, what I want to try to do is explain why I think the new framework is problematic and uh, likely to result in becoming, making policy less predictable and more discretionary, as I just say, said. Um, and I'm going to allude at the end to talk a little bit about kind of what I think would be better or at least... Um, the way I would have thought about this strategic review as an alternative. And it is true that one of the things I've become uh, after my time at the Fed for almost 10 years um, was understanding about institutions and that it's hard to make radical changes in the Fed. And you end up making incremental steps um, and so that's the kind of the way I've been, I've been thinking about it um, and how do you do that? So, um, so let me start off on the next slide with talking a little bit about the original 2012 statement. The purpose of that statement at the time was clearly to enhance transparency and accountability of the Fed by clarifying the Fed's interpretation of what its mandates meant and how it was gonna pursue them. And that was a very important step at the time. Uh, many people at the Fed had found, uh, had hoped to get to an inflation target for many years. It had been discussed uh, for a decade or more, um, more than a decade, but it hadn't really come to pass. One of the things that I think helped motivate getting us to an inflation target in 2012, was that in part, the Fed was beginning to adopt policies that were strongly uh, directed towards forward guidance. That is trying to make commitments in the future. And many of us within the Fed were saying, I have my doubts about, about the success of that, but we're, that's not really the point. The point is in order to make that, increase the odds of forward guidance working, it's very important to um, clarify 
and solidify a commitment to an inflation target in order to improve the chances of that forward guidance working. And it was that kind of thinking that helped motivate the broader committee to come around to establishing an inflation target. So that statement in 2012 did two, two or three things, three things I'm gonna, I wanna emphasize. One is it did establish an inflation target. Uh, and the second thing it did was to uh, explain why a numeric target for employment mandate uh, was not feasible or desirable. Um, one of the interesting things I'll note about the inflation target is uh, I think most people, myself included, viewed an inflation target as a way of the Fed thinking about uh, the public thinking about what the Fed was doing. If inflation was above its target, it would be seeking to bring inflation down towards its target. If inflation was below its target, the Fed would seek to take actions to get inflation back up to target. That is, it was a symmetric mandate and that was their objective. Um, I think it's interesting because this brings up how you see this manifesting itself is in what they call the Survey of Economic Predictions, the so-called SCPs. And one of the things you note in those, they were started actually in 2007, was the first SCP. But what you see in those things, those uh, surveys, is that the inflation part of the, of the forecast, I call them forecasts, we shouldn't, they're projections. And every one of them, what you will see is no matter where inflation is today, the SEPs will show that the inflation projections are always moving back towards 2%. That is not, and this is often confused in the public, that is not an unconditional forecast. That projection of inflation going back to its target is a function of appropriate policy. That is each individual member uh, of the committee sets its policy in a way that gets the economy back to 2%. So it's a mistake to think of those as forecasts because they're conditional for They're not unconditional forecasts, they're conditional forecasts. So it may be true that the whole committee views them growing back to target. It also may be true that they have very different policy perspectives that will allow the economy to do that. Um, and that's really the lesson from the SEPs, and those shouldn't be forecasts. But they always had inflation is coming back to 2%. And in fact, if they didn't, you would worry about what the committee members were thinking in terms of what the right policy would be. Of course, the other thing is, um, the third thing, um, I'll, I'm sorry, the thing on, on un unemployment, the Fed said we didn't have a target, that it was too, it was unobservable, it was not known. But one of the interesting things the statement did in 2012, which I wasn't real happy about, but they did it, we did it. Um, there's a couple of sentences in there about using the SEP forecast of unemployment as a guide of what the committee thought about its employment mandate. I actually thought that was uh, not very wise. It suggested that we knew what the number was and that the number was valid over the long term. Um, but on the other hand, what that did do is that if you look at the changes in the 2012 statement, every year, almost every year, or every quarter, no, I'm sorry, every, every, every year, um, <clears throat> that number changed. That is, in the SEP, the forecast or projection of the long run unemployment rate changed every year. And so every year the statement had to change somewhat to reflect that change in the committee's perception of the long run unemployment rate. And of course, during the teens, during that decade, every year that forecast went down. Each year the, the unemployment target, or not target, but the unemployment projection, long-term unemployment projection got lower and lower and lower. The last piece of the 2012 statement I want to refer to is a phrase um, 
that the Fed, when the two legs of the mandate were in conflict, the Fed would follow a balanced approach to achieving both its goals. Now, that was pretty vague, and many of us were a little puzzled, not puzzled, but frustrated that the committee could not get more specific about that. Um, but um, it did convey the notion that we were inflation targeting and that we would follow a balanced approach to meeting both those goals uh, uh, as they were laid out. So that was kind of the 2012 statement. And it really didn't change very much except for the numbers on unemployment uh, that were put in there each year. Let's skip to 2020 now and the, the new statement uh, that was released in uh, August of 2020. First thing I want to mention is this revised statement was not, not a simple update of its previous statements. In fact, my view is that um, this new statement laid the foundations for a very significant reorientation of the entire policy framework the Fed uses. So this was not a trivial change. It wasn't, as some Fed members have said, uh, oh, this is just evolutionary and we're just making, we're just fine tuning. That's not the case as far as I'm concerned. This new the new statement altered the interpretation of the Fed's mandates in significant ways, in particular in ways that had important ramifications about how they go about conducting policy. So why did they do this? Well, they did this for three, three reasons, I think. One is um, the Fed has been fretting, I could say obsessed, with the zero lower bound, effective lower bound on monetary policy. Uh, it has been a topic of conversation for a long time, um, but the Fed wanted to address its concerns over the zero lower bound. They were also wanting to address the inflation experience that followed the financial crisis. Not the inflation experience of any other time, but the inflation experience following the financial crisis. And third, they wanted to enhance and prioritize uh, the employment mandate more so than it was in the, in the other statement. Um, so let me talk just briefly in the next slide um, about uh, how they changed uh, their interpretation of the mandates didn't change, but their interpretation of them changed. First of all, uh, as we all know, and I'll try to go this quickly, they dropped an inflation target, dropped an inflation targeting, and adopted what they call a goal of I'll call it asymmetric average inflation targeting. Each one of those descriptors, asymmetric, flexible, and average, are all important <laughs> to un trying to untangle and describe this new policy. So they're important. What I'm going to argue is that this new policy was actually not very helpful. The descriptors are vague. Rather than add clarity and transparency to their policy, they added confusion and uncertainty and greater opportunities for discretion. Charlie, can I, can I ask you a question on this point? Sure. Um, sure. I read a lot of this stuff as, as you said, it was uh, designed for the zero bound and a fight against deflation. Right. And I read a lot of it in the surrounding speeches as well as uh, sort of a ringing endorsement that the central thing they believed in was forward guidance. If we could only promise to keep rates lower for longer, then that would stimulate today. Yeah. And I read that the flexible, and now, so what do you do? The average inflation targeting was a way of saying we won't, start raising interest rates as soon as we see inflation. We're trying to commit ourselves not to do it, which we're not. <laughs> and then, but as, as you're pointing out, there's a tension here. If that's what you want to do, you want to try to tie yourself to the mast. Yeah. 
but then it gets all flexible and unmeasurable. Uh, so you're reading it as, as just a way of giving yourself discretion, which is what it's turned into. Um, but there, there seems to be a, a that seemed to be the, the, the motivation, right? And then it's kind of a puzzle that they wrote it with such discretion. Yes, I agree. That was the motivation. That's kind of what I'm saying with the rationale for this, is it was tr they were trying to solve, if you will, the zero bound problem. And they were, they, the whole idea was to take a strategy. Uh, I think it was first proposed by Woodford, but Rice Schneider and Williams and others. And yeah. the argument there, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but the argument there, you're exactly right. The argument there was that actually a price level target, which is a version of an average inflation target, was perhaps a means to help you address that problem by allowing the public to understand that average inflation means that when you're too low, you've got to overshoot in order to get the average up. But it also means that if you're too high, you need to be too low for a while in order to get the average up. So that would be a kind of a symmetric inflation target and uh, or a price level target. It, it, were, it has to be symmetric to be a price level target. So they're not now saying well, average inflation is, is still low. So, you know, we're doing exactly what we said. They seem to have forgotten this whole business. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, they never tied it to, they, well, we can get into the weeds on this, but the, their language was very noncommittal in many ways. There was a lot of language about um, commitment and, 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 and to this, that, and the other, and doing this for some time and, that for a shorter period of time and committing to this, but there was so many dimensions of this that it became, my interpretation, so muddled that it really ends up being a commitment to nothing. <laughs> so without some metrics around average and even average inflation target, without some metrics around that, the Fed can always argue, well, yeah, we're going to get to average. We're not just there. We're just not there yet. <laughs> so um, um, without the um, metrics, uh, I, I, it's, it really makes it, I don't want to say contentless, but it makes the level of commitment far less. When, when, when Clarida said in a speech, I think he even said it at, at this seminar a year ago, 2% inflation is an ex ante aspiration. What kind of commitment is that? It's about as non committal as you can in this kind of framework. So, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Hey, I'm a, but you're right on target, John. I have a quick, simple question. Um, they never said the period of time over which you would average. No. Nope. It's always worried me. Would this have been remedied if they said, okay, three years or one year or two? Well, years? it would it would have been better because that's committing to something <laughs> rather than some average over the infinite future or as unspecified future. Um, but you, what you see has happened is that's why because they then added this asymmetric policy, which is not in price level targeting or even average inflation targeting. It's a one-sided framework where you only make up for shortfalls. I, I, I of course, you can't have a one-sided makeup, ignore it, offset the shortfalls, but don't offset the overshoots. You'll never reach the average. It's conceptually inconsistent with an average target of two percent, it will have to be. Even if they executed it perfectly, it'll have to be above two percent. Um, so uh, that's why they needed the word flexible, <laughs> and why Powell emphasized. Well, I don't really mean average in arithmetic sense. This is going to be flexible. Well, flexible. What does that mean? So we, how much? How long will the overshoot go on? How much undershoot will they tolerate? I mean, there is so much wiggle room in this. It's really not a commitment to much of anything. And yet, the point I want to make is that 
without that commitment, that clear commitment, that's credible, this policy doesn't work to solve the zero bound problem. Because as Woodford and Reichsneider and Williams and other, other people have sort of said, this strategy addresses the zero or bound by the credible commitment by the Fed to overshoot inflation by a certain amount at particular times and then be able to bring inflation back down to its long run average. If you don't have the commitment and the credibility to deliver on that, the scheme doesn't work. So, um, um, so I think that the whole effort as you've been describing is one uh, that we've been talking about is an effort to address the zero lower bound problem, but does not make sufficient commitments to make that credible, in which case it's not going to work. So it's not going to solve the problem they set out to solve. I'll, I'll we'll come back to this point more because this is really an important point for them that they describe a process an implementation strategy that if executed perfectly does not deliver long-term average inflation of 2%. <laughs> how much above, so there's an inflation bias here and how much above 2% it would actually be will depend on shocks. How often will they, how often will um, inflation be above 2%? Will the shocks raise it too high? And therefore, it's going to, that, since they're not going to over, they're not going to offset the overshoots. That's going to raise the average inflation rate at the end of the day. Charlie, so I find the whole concept there a bit incoherent. There's a question from uh, Robert. Robert and who's Robert? I don't see. That's me. Robert. <laughs> oh. I was known as Bob. Uh, oh. So so can you tell us anything? It seems just deeply shocking uh, that. This the asymmetry that you're emphasizing quite properly it could have ever gotten written in. It's just crazy. Uh, but but who's who? These are all intelligent people that we know well, right? You know. Yeah, I, I can John, John Williams. I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't there, Bob. But but I I would say this. I do think that the way the Fed, in all likelihood, was interpreting this is I think they saw the asymmetry of the policy as they described it as a signal of their commitment to get inflation above 2%. Oh, I see. But what they didn't, what they didn't address was, okay, well then how do you, how do you achieve an anchor long-term expectations at 2% when this strategy Sure. Doesn't deliver that. Right. Or can't deliver that unless you're just lucky. Yeah. I think it was quite deliberate. I, I had a very interesting. Well, I think it was deliberate that, for that reason. That's what I well, would say. So. I remember asking Ben Bernanke this exact question when he was talking about price level targets. And he said, you know, we make up shortfalls, but if we go over there, we just forget about it. <laughs> so he was very clear about that. <laughs> was that was that his description of the practical effect or? or his recommendation? Uh, that was his description of how he thought we should run monetary policy. Well, he had, a, he had, he had uh, several years ago, I mean, some of the Fed, I think, interpret this new policy as a, a, a regime switching model. And it's a regime switching model in the sense that Ben had talked about it, which was you, um, um, uh, when you're stuck at the lower bound, by the lower bound, uh, you want to price up in target, which means you overshoot. But as soon as you switch, as soon as you've done that, you switch regimes and, and the way Ben described it is go back to inflation targeting. Um, this is, this is known that, as zigzag policy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so it's a regime, a regime switching model. And, um, a lot of people found that, I think found that. Uh, appealing, and and it would result in I think it would result in sort of the same thing, but Ben didn't have the average inflation targeting going on forever. 
it would switch back to a price uh, inflation target after you recovered. But that still doesn't, you still have to explain that so <laughs> to the public because you've got to have expectations going in the right way at the right time, which I think is really a problem. I don't think the Fed has enough control over expectations to be able to manipulate them in the way that this regime envisions to be successful. Um, it sounds like basically they wanted to set a higher target than 2%. And this is, as you pointed out, amounts to raising the- Exactly. And I said that, I've said that- It's a backdoor way to, to get a higher target. It's a, it's a backdoor way to get a higher target. Yeah. And so that's just, that's just, it's incredible to me that somebody would, would, would they would think that that's what they were doing. <laughs> oh, 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 we think they're doing this in order to hide the effort to get a higher inflation target. Why don't they just argue for a higher inflation target? I mean, the I agree. Thing, the other thing to keep in mind is that this was um, reformulated re just eight years after the first framework. And they've announced, I think they've announced that they're going to review it every five years from now on. Right. Like that's best practice. So it, it may be, um, you know, a mistake to think of this as uh, a regime that's anticipated to apply over an entire set sequence of business cycles and more like the way they want to lean going forward. I mean, it's broadly speaking, the purpose was to provide um, an avenue towards a more dovish cast to policy. Um, the, the inflation target is a constraint on the extent to which they can promote stronger employment, and this just opens more doors in that direction. Well, I, I would say, I, Jeff, I think that's right at some level, which really means that the way to interpret this was a tactical decision, not a long-run strategy. Yeah or a long-run right. state of intentions. But that's also misleading, <laughs> I think, because that's, this is really not a long-run strategy. This is what they want to do in the short run. Uh, right. And if so, they, I, I think this was the wrong way to go about that. That's just my, I don't think you build something as a long-run strategy when it's really intended for the short run. Um, but that's, a, that's kind of a different, different topic. Um, I don't know where I am in my slides now, but keep moving forward. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I think the other thing I want to talk about was um, two Charlie, things. You were, you, were at, um, you were at inclusive growth on your slides. Ah, so right. if you want to say a word about that, <laughs> it would be welcome. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that uh, we were talking about the reinterpretations of the mandate. Um, the other thing they did was to alter the interpretation of the employment mandate which intentionally they added the word inclusive uh, as a sort of new distributional dimension to its interpretation of the employment mandate. And it also moved away from what the old Fed used to do, which was focus on the unemployment rate rather than the level of employment. Um, but um, the problem with the inclusive mandate is once again, ties into my argument before, which is um, twofold. One is it affords more latitude for the Fed to make discretionary decisions about what is their goal at any particular time. You know, and um, I think that adding that additional distributional aspect to their mandate is going to come back to bite them when time comes, when they want to tighten or do something that may be at odds with somebody's measure of inclusiveness. Uh, and I think that is going to be not only make their decisions more difficult and more discretionary, but it also opens the door for more political pressure and interference that's going to further undermine Fed independence. It's inviting the political conversations to take place in ways that will be detrimental to its independence, I think. Um, so I think that that was a very important change as well. Um, 
So I want I want to raise questions a little bit about whether the uh, let me skip that for for time for time purposes. Um, all right. So the Fed added flexible in order to get around the problem that their strategy doesn't really deliver an average inflation rate of two percent. If the Fed is was worried about its credibility, remember. The Fed was worried about the zero bound and its rationale for this change in framework was they wanted to solve the zero bound problem. But one of their challenges they admitted was that well, the zero bound was putting pressure on inflation expectations, depressing those inflation expectations. And there are some theoretical models that, where you can get that result. And the Fed believed that that was one of the reasons they couldn't get Fed, they get, couldn't get the inflation rate up. Well, another way to interpret that same statement is why didn't the Fed have credibility to get inflation up? Was the zero bound undermining their, their credibility or did they just not have enough credibility? Or did they not fly enough, um, enough monetary combination? Four trillion dollars in, in reserves and seven years of zero interest rates wasn't enough, um, apparently. Some people would say so. Um, so if their credibility was questioned by the zero bound, what makes them think that they're going to have the required credibility to pull off this more complicated scheme? <laughs> of moving expectations around and delivering, what makes them think they're gonna be able to do that in this new environment they've created? I don't know. Uh, so I think that that's another reason to be skeptical uh, using the Fed's own views about whether or not they have sufficient credibility to pull off this lower for longer, lower for longer framework. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things the Fed didn't consider in this review, I think. I mean, it wasn't apparent. I mean, a lot of, things, a lot of other things were going on uh, after the financial crisis. Banks were obviously in trouble for a long time. Um, the uh, regulatory environment for, for banks changed considerably in terms of capital requirements, new measures of liquidity requirements. I mean, you can just go down the list of how the banking system changed. The Fed also begin, began using IOR, interest on reserves, which had never done before. And lastly, they flooded the banking system with QE using, flooded the banking system with reserves doing QE, which basically destroyed the Fed funds market. All of these things, I would at least suggest, potentially had ramifications for, let me call it the old transmission mechanism of monetary policy, which usually used to work through the banking system. Um, and that was all upended. So I think the Fed should have tried to understand the ramifications of its own policies and frameworks it was using to understand maybe why inflation wasn't responding in the way that they thought. Um, I don't. I don't have an answer for that, but I sure would like to know more about it and whether or not the 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 interpretation that it was the zero bound. And by the way, there was a structural change in the Phillips curve that is now flat, where it where its excuses, obviously none of which, neither one of which had anything to do with them, but. Uh, I, I want to ask you about this flat Phillips curve because I'm really fascinated by it. Does the Fed regard the Phillips curve as unemployment causes inflation or does it regard the Phillips curve as inflation causes unemployment? I think the, the, the practically and as a matter of, uh, of uh, what they do, the answer is they do unemployment is causing inflation. Uh, slack. More slack, less inflation. Less slack, more inflation. Unemployment was in there 
inflation equations in the FRB model uh, for um, a long time. Uh, they talked for a long time about the coefficient on slack measures was very low. But I thought we had learned that back in the 70s. <laughs> well, we also from learned ag uh, from, uh, from, uh, from others from others that, you know, um, that view has problems with it. We, we learned uh, from Bob Hall that this is a cloud of points and not a structural relationship. But these are so the inclusive growth idea then is that we can, our, our, we'll push down slack and then we won't get a lot of inflation as a result. And we'll give a lot of speeches to keep expectations from jumping up. Is right, sort of that's, 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 the, that's the, and that they can do that, that they can do that. And that they have the credibility to keep inflation expectations under control and controlled as they see them needed uh, in, in the framework to deliver on that. But if you look at, um, I think it's slide, we're skipping around a lot now, but there's a fly, slide um, that has a quote from Powell that sort of explains this. I think it's slide. Uh, mm, I, I didn't mean to, to un, unhinge you. That was a short no, question. No, that's right. a nice answer. <laughs> but let me, but let me, let me read you this, the statement. Uh, in, in Powell's speech at Jackson Hole a year ago, he said, going forward, employment can run at or above real-time estimates of its maximum level without causing concern unless accompanied by signs of unwanted increases in inflation or the emergence of other risks. That is to say, there's no Phillips curve particularly. <laughs> um, and then this ne the next sentence says, of course, when employment is below its maximum level, as it's clearly the case now, we will actively seek to minimize that shortfall by using our tools to support economic growth and job creation. So um, that basically says that either the Phillips curve is L-shaped or horizontal and then goes vertical, or it's just horizontal the whole way through. No, and you just said something else that struck me uh, um, about this new framework. We used to think that the Fed was there to reduce volatility to you know, go back to the middle of the sine wave. And now we're shortfalls, like it's 1965, that, uh, that we, we're, we're gonna fill in between the peaks, not reduce the volatility. Then, right. then. There, is, right. there is no being too hot, but just an incredible no. change in, in, in intellectual framework. Yes, Very that's good. why I say this is a radical change. But Very then good. of course, the Fed, the Fed elaborated on this, and you've all heard this, but it's now in the statement, has been in every statement since September, last September, a year ago. The committee decided to keep the target range of inflation of federal funds rate at zero to one quarter percent and expects it will be appropriate to maintain this target until labor markets have reached levels consistent with the committee's assessments of maximum employment and, and inflation has risen to 2% is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. So there's a two-prong um, condition for moving, let's say, the Fed funds rate. One is not only must you be at full employment, all right, but inflation must be higher than 2% and expected to be there for some time. So, this is a remarkable shift in the way the Fed conducts policy in my, in my, from my perspective. Um, and the essence of it is that in seeking to do what it wants to do, the policy requires, I'm gonna go back to it, an extraordinary degree of credibility and commitment to deliver on this and have it do what they want to do. It's a complex strategy for the public to understand. 
one of the things I kind of came to realize when I was at the Fed is that the old KISS principle has some merit here. Keep it simple, stupid. And the complexity of what the Fed is trying to do, regardless of whether you think it was right, or even if, while we think it works in theory, it's never really been tried before, but that they're asking a lot of itself and a lot of the public, which makes me nervous and uncomfortable with whether or not they can really be successful with it. And if they're not successful with it, they're running a regime that clearly has inflation bias. I, I told one, I said at one point, I said, you know, the Fed used to get criticized by markets and others because they view the 2% as a ceiling. No, it was a target. It was symmetric. But now this new regime to me sounds like, well, 2% is now a floor <sighs> because the regime they described is one that has a bias upward and um, really won't achieve an average inflation target unless they're just, just lucky. So, um, so I think the Fed has outlined, set a task for itself with a framework that's going to be hard to deliver on and is going to result in a far more discretionary, unpredictable path of policy than that it has before. Early, and those are kind of my two major, major early, uh, concerns. Bob Hall, Bob Hall and Larry Meyer have their hands up. You want to call on them, Bob and Larry? Bob, go ahead. Okay, so uh, this is backing up a bit, but when when Powell says uh, if things are going okay uh, and uh, unemployment is declining, but uh, inflation's not taking off, um, which was of course true until uh, uh, February <laughs> so of 2020, <laughs> um, uh, then what one the, it seems like that most people are saying well that that's because the Fed believed or or at least Powell believed that the Phillips curve was completely flat, but there's another completely coherent and also as it happens correct statement which is that as time goes by they and nothing much happens uh, in a quiescent economy, uh, uh, the uh, the natural unemployment rate uh, declines over time, um, and that would exactly rationalize. And I've, that's the view that I've always attributed to him because, because research that I've been involved in has demonstrated that, that that's true and has always been true, um, that the natural rate is not a constant. Uh, it's something that bumps up uh, when there's a crisis, leaving a legacy of unemployment, and then the unemployment is very gradually worked off. Uh, and as it's worked off, the natural rate declines. And and so you, you get it's it's a much more coherent policy stance under that hypothesis than under yeah, but, conventional but, hypothesis. Uh, so Bob, I may not disagree with that, but that's not what they say. <laughs> no, but you can impute it. You can impute it. To, if why, says why, something and, and it, why would you conduct sense. policy in a way that requires the people or the public to infer something? Um, and even if you thought they were serious about this, uh, well, they are serious, but thought they could pull this off um, without a greater um, articulation of the metrics and their reaction function, it's going to take many, many cycles for the public to become to unravel the reaction function here in a way that's going to be beneficial for the policy, I think. And that's really unnecessary too. They could have avoided a lot of that. Larry? Uh, Charlie, I really enjoyed this paper, uh, partly because I agreed with much of what you said, but even more because I disagreed with much of what you said. So let me tell you where I agree. First of all, inflation bias. Oh, absolutely. Uh, here you have a policy where you start from the zero bound and you don't raise, raise rates until you're at 2% and about to exceed 2%. In earlier times, we would have called that reckless. So that is a, that is a problem. Um, second, though, um, you know, 
I, you haven't really gotten the definition of maximum employment right. And I understand it because they've been so incoherent about it. Uh, but let me tell you uh, how I understand it and what Clarida and Williams say about it and, and Powell did at the last press conference. Maximum employment is the highest level of employment that doesn't uh, endanger the price stability objective. It kind of might see the Nairu kind of creeping through there. So this is just the Nairu in, in different language. And of course, there's also a story, you can't estimate it. You have to identify it with experience. Um, you, you seem to think that uh, flexible average inflation targeting is about average inflation targeting. I, I could understand how you might think that, uh, but it really isn't. Um, it's about overshooting after undershooting. The overshooting has to be modest and totally independent of the degree of cumulative undershoot. So it's not really average inflation target. I think what's really important here though, in the end of the challenge is, this is a very unprecedented situation the Fed is following. And with, with a lot of risk, you look at these and you say, these are supply shocks. We should, we should look through them. But uh, what um, Powell said at the last press conference is really good. He said, we see higher inflation persisting, and we have to be positioned to address the risk that it be, that it should it become a threat to or create a threat of more persistent long term inflation. So we don't really think of supply shocks as generating a threat of persistent long term inflation. This does because it's persistent and broadening, and that's what pushing the Fed to tighten uh, lift off much earlier than it otherwise would have expected. So Larry, I. I don't disagree with a lot of what you said, but I, and I think you're providing what their interpretation is. It no, is that their interpretation is changing. So when Powell started this, he said, we will not, uh, we will not, not only will we not forecast inflation, all right, that is, we will not rely on forecast to preemptively address inflation. He said that. He also said that as long, <clears throat> that the requirement for liftoff, at least with interest rates, is that you were at maximum employment and over 2%. That's a dual, a double, double requirement. I think you're right in the back of most of the policymakers' head that I've talked to, and when you listen to them, they still really do have a Phillips curve under their hat, that they, that they, the way they think about this. But they're not, they're not, talking about it that way. They're being forced to talk about it that way a bit. And it is no wonder that when after Powell having said and the committee having said that they won't address inflation until they've reached maximum employment. When I've asked individual policymakers, well, what happens if inflation comes before you've reached maximum employment? What will you do? And the answer has always been some form of, for lack of a better phrase, that can't happen, or that won't happen, or that's a very small probability. We don't have to worry about that. Well, there's nothing in their framework that they have articulated that allows them to address that. And now is a situation in which they see that, they've admitted that high uh, national employment hasn't been reached. They do have high inflation. So given that they sort of were put in, the, they put themselves in this box, they've now got to wiggle their way out somehow. And they're beginning to do that by changing the language of what they mean by maximum employment or uh, about how they'll react, which is fine, but it doesn't justify the framework as they articulate it. So I'll go, I'll go to Bob King. So they say Bob, Bob King has a question. Bob, I think that's Robert, but anyway. Yeah, Bob. okay, sorry, I'm formal there on the screen. Um, so Charlie, you've talked a lot about credibility. And in my reading, um, the Fed's taken the wrong lesson from the great, great financial crisis and subsequent events. So when I think about it, 
the, the problem that the Fed faced in 2008 was that it did not have credibility for maintaining an inflation rate of 2%. People thought that the inflation was going to go down and was going to go down in a sustained way. And I think, actually, it's great that Larry Meyer is here, because I think the reason that people thought that was that during the 1990s, the Fed discussed, and some people suggest implemented, a policy of so-called opportunistic disinflation. That if disinflation, if inflation came in low, they were going to just let it ratify, pass through to the to a lower inflation rate. So in 2008, they didn't really have credibility for maintaining 2% inflation. By 2012, when you guys were formulating this statement, it was very clear that the only way you can get credibility is by telling the public what you're going to do and then do it. It had taken four years between 2008 and 2012 with proposals by Evans and other people to kind of come up with a stated policy that was then going to be followed to a greater or, or, or lesser extent. And so what really, I think the, the risky experiment here is that the Fed is walking away completely from the idea of trying to accumulate credibility. That's the big risk. Um, and we're in a situation that if one looks at the sweep of, of, of uh, US monetary history is a really troubling time. Because when was the last time we had really big supply shocks? 1974, 1975. And what happened during that period? There were these temporary surges, oil price increases, mean a one-time increase in the inflation rate, but then those were ratified, built into inflation expectations, and a period of sustained higher inflation ensued. So I do think that the risks are on the table, and I think it's entirely associated with walking away from having a stated coherent policy. So the murkiness that you stressed is important, but it's also walking away from trying to think about developing and managing um, your credibility. So that wasn't a question, yeah, Charlie. Yeah. No, I know. I I, I I I share your concerns, Bob. I think they're that they're um, they're very consistent with what what I've been trying to say. I will say, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I talked about the 2012 statement, I I was signaling that that the the reason, in some ways, we got that policy written for better or for worse, or whether it was what I exactly what I wanted and tried to draft or, or whatever. The reason we got to an inflation target was, as I said, we were trying, the Fed was trying to rely on forward guidance. And and Charlie Evans's you know proposal and some others where we were thinking about how to formulate that forward guidance, the committee came to realize that we couldn't really do that without credibility. And we couldn't really do that without an inflation target of some kind to help pin things down and, and demonstrate, helping demonstrate. So in some ways, I think you're exactly, that's another way of saying, I think what you're saying as well, that that, that was really important. And that my view is what we've gone to here in this new regime is a step back from that. I think we've stepped in, taken a step back away from developing or creating credibility and transparency. Um, and so I think, I really believe this frame, new framework was a, was a step in the wrong direction at the end of the day. That's so we have, we have John Cochran, Mickey Levy, and Chris Essig. <clears throat> Thank this, this was great. Um, as I'm understanding this, the big issue is the Fed does now understand that expectations matter. And this was a big effort in trying to get inflation expectations back up to 2% by saying, making all sorts of promises uh, that maybe you do and don't intend to keep and don't, you'd like to tie yourself to the mask, but not really. What's amazing about the effort was that it sounds like they didn't even consider, you're, you're making a strategic plan. 
and not even considering, well, what if we have to go in the opposite direction? <laughs> what if someday inflation expectations are in the upper direction and we need to telegraph our commitments to what we'll do about it to keep that in line. Now that's not hard. We've all, we all lived through 1980 <laughs> and the commitment that anchors of inflation expectations is a commitment we will repeat 1980 if we have to. The Fed is, won't even breathe a whiff of that's what they might have to do. And I think, you know, if we actually think about our Fed raising interest rates to 20%, causing a massive uh, recession, um, uh, raising the deficit to a trillion dollars a year because of interest costs, the chances of them doing it is next to nothing. But it's interesting that they, you know, a, a general who said, a, a general who said, I don't worry about events that I don't forecast will happen would be fired. If the Fed was, uh, if the Fed was doing a stress test on the bank and I asked the bank, well, what happens if there's a recession? The bank says, well, our forecast so is that there isn't going to be a recession, so we don't worry about that. You know, the bank would fail the stress test. Uh, but the Fed here did not even think about a plan of, though knowing that expectations matter, uh, what if we ever have to cap them on the upper end? This is just off the table. Well, I think I think I, I agree, John. I think that the that when I mentioned that we are in a spot now where inflation's higher than the Fed would like to see it. There's no question, um, but. Um, uh, they put themselves in this box of, by pre-announcing that they wouldn't react. That's what Powell's statement was about, as long as we weren't at maximum employment. They never thought they'd be there. So this wasn't in the playbook. Well, well, and it was, maybe and, maybe and, they did buy themselves some credibility here. They said, we're going to keep interest rates for long, unbelievably long, even if inflation comes back up. Well, right. So here's, here's the problem, though. It's, it, they put themselves in a spot where they could be damned if they do and damned if they don't. Their credibility, if they don't follow through on the employment promise and let inflation go, they're going to lose, in credibility, they, they lose inflation credibility. So, if they address inflation and don't follow through on their employment objective and commitment, they lose credibility there too. I'm sorry, you said this, but 10 million job openings, 7 million unemployed. Can't you just say mission accomplished, we're done? Well, I, I predict that's, what we're, that's where, what we're going to get to. The Fed is going to find a way to wordsmith this so that they say, well, we've reached our goal. So we're not reneging our inflation commitment. We're going to act, but it's because we've reached maximum employment. That's discretion. It work, so and, and I think that's gonna. That's what they're gonna try to do. Mickey Levy and Chris. Yeah. So, Charlie, I mean, my my view is the Fed is very well intentioned. Oh, um, I, I agree. I'm, and, and, okay, and 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 in 2018, 19, when it was when it was do, undergoing its strategic review, it was truly worried about a decline in inflationary expectations and, and the effect of zero bound. Um, and so, so in, its, in its new strategy, it relies very heavily on, on discretionary policies because those discretionary policies worked following the financial crisis. And so my view of things is the Fed basically relied on the wrong model. And that model was, um, you know, the Fed could keep rates at zero and it could engage in QE2 and QE3 and inflation stayed muted. And that was just the wrong, absolutely the wrong model. And, and so now they have this, this new strategy and they have to use discretionary policy because they really don't have a framework. But getting back to your point about this Strat new strategies, you call it a step back from the 2012 consensus. We have to ask the question, you know, the, the, their discretion, how has the Fed's reaction function changed? And I think under the 2012 consensus, it would, you know, the, the Fed, we, could, we would be able to assess what the reaction function of the Fed might be. Now, um, 
you know, we have to ask the question, um, you know, will, will the Fed um, raise the funds rate above our star to reduce inflation back to 2%? And of course, that's totally discretionary on, the, on, on, on behalf of the Fed, but I, I just concur with your point. But I think the Fed's intentions didn't work out because the strategy just didn't capture any risks that might occur and relied just so heavily on the behavior of following the financial crisis and life's just different now. Interesting, Mickey, I, I don't disagree with that. John, uh, oh, I'd like to reserve two minutes to talk about what I would have done, just sort of- just Yes, sort of it's important, because uh, Chris has it, a question, yeah, then go ahead. Okay. Great. Well, in your, your very interesting presentation, uh, you drew attention to the consequences of the flat Phillips curve, and certainly in the context of a demand-induced recession, such as after the GFC, a flat Phillips curve is quite benign uh, and you know, really allows the central bank to uh, run uh, the economy hot and allow unemployment to uh, fall to, to low levels without risking much upward inflationary pressure. But you know, in the context of current developments where we're facing persistent adverse supply shocks, the flat Phillips curve can be quite a curse. And uh, in particular, it makes it extremely costly for central banks to tighten policy to try to rein in inflation. So just you know, kind of using rules of thumb estimates uh, you know, to push down inflation by one percentage point roughly causes uh, or would require the unemployment rate to go up by five percentage points using standard Phillips curve uh, estimates. So the sacrifice ratio is really high. It presents very difficult choices for central banks, including the Fed and many other central banks. I was just wondering about your perspectives on how central banks should navigate these difficult trade-offs. Should they pursue more gradual uh, tightening or uh, somewhat more aggressive as we've seen in a number of emerging markets? So I, I guess my answer to that is, um, I, I think my recommendation, my preference would be that um, to get to your last point, I would encourage the Fed to start earlier thinking about the gradual tightening so that if they are wrong about this transitory, um, that they don't have to be forced into a very rapid response, <laughs> which could be even more damaging um, and causing recession as John Chalker was pointing out earlier. So that would be my general policy information. But I wanna say, up front, they should have never put themselves in this position <laughs> because in, in my view, they did it to themselves by the language they used. So um, um, I view this as kind of an unforced error. And of course, Powell has to say that the inflation is temporary now, transitory, because if he doesn't, then the whole argument of the framework begins to crumble beneath his feet. Uh, and what you, what you, and I would prefer them talking more about policy. So I think that if inflation turns out to be more persistent than many people are thinking or than Powell is thinking, it's going to be because of policy. That because monetary and fiscal policy are so aggressively accommodated, that that's what's going to make inflation persistent. And it's just not, and I would prefer the Fed posing the question like this, well, what do we have to do with this? And what can we do about it? Um, accommodating it for so long will lead to the 70s again, which none of us want, but the framework is really setting us up for exactly that kind of, that kind of policy error. So, um, John, can, I take two, can, I make two, can I take two minutes? Yeah, I just wanted to, and also, uh, they, they need your slide number. If you use your slides, tell them the slide number. Uh, well, I'm not using, I haven't used it okay. for a while. <laughs> but go to the very end, Michelle. Go to uh, slide 17. Uh, 
I'm just going to try to do the last few slides very quick. Cool. So Good. people often ask me, well, you criticize a lot. What would you do differently? Well, th this is my attempt to sort of describe to you how I would think about this. And I think how I, I, and I would have thought about this way where I still on see. Terms of I want to preserve independence. And I think that the Fed has to be very careful not to put its policy framework in a, in a position where it's going to expose them to greater and greater political pressure. Um, and the other thing is, in a democracy, to have independence, you've got to have constraints on policy. You can't just grant the Fed all sorts of powers with no constraints. So you got to think about what the right constraints are. So uh, with those two, next slide, with those two principles in mind, um, let me say how uh, I would have approached this review and thought about revising the principles. First of all, I could live with an average inflation targeting. I have some sympathy for price level targeting. Um, uh, 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 slide 19. I have a sympathy for price level targeting. As I explained earlier, there are some problems with it. There's the commitment of will you be symmetric all right. And I think you need to have some metrics around it. You know, it's an inflation rate over five years or something, something to tie it down to make it a commitment. Uh, but then you could operate a price level targeting regime or an average inflation targeting regime. Perfectly sensible if you have enough commitment around it that you're willing to follow. Uh, I'd also be happy with a recommitment to inflation targeting. I'm, I, I, I could go either way on that. Um, but an average inflation target would, would need to have some metrics around it to firm up the commitment and credibility. The other thing I think is missing from the Fed's entire discussion is balance sheet policy. The Fed has been using balance sheet policy extensively since 2008. Um, this would be a hard task for the Fed, but the Fed is using its balance sheet uh, as a tool of monetary policy. It's using it as a tool of financial stability. It's using it as a tool for credit allocation. And they're putting it to all sorts of use and, and at different times justify its use for different reasons. I think that's a really bad state of affairs. <clears throat> I think the, nobody quite understands when they're trying to be a lender of last resort, whether they're trying to subsidize housing through buying MBS, or whether they're using it as monetary policy and QE to get around um, to get around the zero bound. All of those things have been at work in one form or another throughout this period. And that needs to be clarified and limited in some way. And the Fed needs to do that. And it has not done that. And it really needs to do that and integrate its balance, particularly if they're going to continue with a ample reserve or a floor system with a big balance sheet. I think that's, that part's a mistake, but given that that's where they are, they need to declare something about their uh, uh, balance sheet policy. The other thing I would do um, would be to, uh, I wouldn't have changed the employment mandate. I think that is, is dangerous both for independence and politicization. Um, and if you broaden the to-do list for the Fed, just invites more discretion, more policy uncertainty, and greater political interference. That's the other thing. The third thing I would do, and this is another hard thing, but I think important. The Fed's language in its 2012 statement was it would pursue a balanced approach. I know where that came from. I was there when it was, when it was done. Um, but it's vague. It's not terribly informative about policy. I think the Fed needs to be more explicit about what that means. And what I mean by that, it needs to be ex more explicit and open about what it views as its reaction function. There needs to be more discussion of that, more transparency surrounding that. And um, again, this is a hard thing for the Fed to do, but I think those two things are really important and would have served the Fed better 
in the longer term if they had taken some of those steps in this statement rather than drawing down this dancing on the head of a pen with all these different dimensions and constraint and ideas about when inflation expectations are going to do this, when it's going to do that, and trying to manipulate manipulate the uh, the public and expectations in the way that this requires. I think there's something to be said for simplicity, and I would have much preferred to see them go down that road, even if it was an av a symmetric average inflation targeting with with metrics. More talk about what the role of the balance sheet is. Um, and more talk about how they think of their reaction function over time. Those would have been, I think, more useful, more useful time spent than this complex uh, process that, that to me has, uh, is, is kind of incoherent to me. So that, that's kind of the last thing I wanted to say. Uh, Charlie, there's one question from Elena Pastorino, which uh, came on the chat. Well, I don't see her video. Elena, you, you hear us? Hi, John. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Something is the matter with my video. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Elena. I, I enjoyed very much your presentation. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Part of my reaction to the listening sessions that the Fed, many local Feds have initiated during the review of strategy period last year. And my impression is that there has been implicitly a tremendous expansion or attempt at expanding the employment mandate. And some of the words of conversation pointing towards an idea that the Fed can effectively intervene in labor markets just through its own standard policy instruments and affect the outcomes, the labor market outcomes of individuals who are various backgrounds that as a society we agree we may want to help out. And so the question is, as you've been brilliantly debating, we are still uncertain what to do about inflation. Is it really the time to, while the instruments are pretty much the same, to increase the goals we wish to achieve? So is this a trend, a new stance, a temporary change, or really a well thought through modification of what the Fed is trying to achieve in modern times? Thank you. So uh, I think this is all, uh, um, I, I don't think the, the ability to, for the Fed to affect or impact or control or even target, I mean, however you want to think about it, um, aspects of employment, whether it be wage inequalities or uh, distribution aspects in terms of employment. Exactly. Or, uh, or I, I don't think the Fed has the tools to do that. My problem is it is it by putting that in their statement and in their mission or to do list is promising something they can't deliver, and trying to deliver it on it is going to be highly distraction, big distraction, means they'll fail to deliver on the things that they perhaps can do. It will open themselves up to political pressure and political debate sacrifice independent. I think this is not something, this is my opinion, it's not something that has been well thought out by the Fed. I worry that this uh, change in emphasis in the statement is, uh, use my words carefully, virtue signaling on the part of the Fed in a way that says, I, I think, if I were in the room, and I, I, I think you would have heard a discussion that says we need to do something about this because if we don't, Congress is going to do it to us. Yes, I've heard that. Uh, and I think there's some truth to that argument. I'm not sure that's the right way to proceed or would have been the right way to proceed. Um, but I think that's a mindset that I could read into the into the Fed, having been there for so long, that, how they thought how they thought about it. But I think doing so is opening Pandora's box in a way that's very dangerous. Thank you. So, Isn't it very perfectly... last question. Very last questions, Bob Hall. Then we have to stop, Bob. There, there's a great ambiguity about what's going on in the labor market today. 
there's there's one view uh, which John Cochran was representative of that with respect to the participants in the labor market, uh, it's very easy to find a job. It's very hard to find a worker. There's all sign, all, every sign uh, with respect to employment uh, and unemployment uh, reads strong. And yet the labor force is more than four percentage points uh, below its trend growth. Um, and if you if you add, if you said well that's that's we should think of that as be, being pretty much the same as unemployment, then that says that we're uh, we have a, a serious employment problem. And of course that shows up that directly accounts for the the shortfall of payroll employment. Uh, so uh, and it's not a crazy proposition. Uh, it's an unresolved question of of. Uh, labor economics, how to understand and interpret this tremendous shortfall in the labor force. So I, I think that an awful lot of, you know, there's, there's very influential people influencing the Fed today saying the labor market is actually very slack because of that four percentage point or 4% uh, shortfall of, and, and you've got you've to play the game today as if we're close to depression levels in the labor market because uh, employment is so low uh, uh, and uh, in spite of the fact that it's very easy to find a job. So it's, it's really a question of how you read the labor market. And that's not, that's not a resolved question. No, I, I agree, Bob, but I also think that it's, it's not at all obvious to me whether monetary policy can directly play a role in the participation rate in those, those kind of issues within the labor sure. market. Agreed, yes, <laughs> but, but we're not sure on that point. We've never tried it before under these circumstances. So there are plenty That's of true. People. Sorry about that. Yeah, so Charlie, we have to stop. Uh, thank you so much. There's people who want to ask you questions. I assume they can email you directly, but thanks. Well, so I'll, much stay, I'll stay on for a minute or two if people want to ask a question. I'm okay. sorry. I, I get it off. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you, John.